Welcome to the Damascus Road Podcast. On the road to Damascus, Paul had a radical encounter with Jesus and his life was changed forever. That is what we hope and pray for here. Now, on to this week's episode. I I narrowed my uh, career options down um, when I graduated college here about eight years ago uh, to three choices. And the first was something loosely related to criminal justice. That was my my degree. Uh, And there were a lot of different areas that I could have gone into. I I got an internship uh, with the, um, uh, it was a federal agency, but it was the postal inspector. So it wasn't like, like when I I say federal agency, it's not what you're thinking, Uh, but it was still really cool. Uh, that ended up not being for me. I enjoyed it. I loved it. Sorting through mail was not my idea of like fighting crime. Uh, although they do a lot of really important work, and I, I got to see none of that important work. It was all sorting through mail and things like that. And then I worked for a little bit as um, I worked at a law office, a law firm, right after I graduated for about four days uh, because it was a, a debt collection law office, which I didn't know when I applied. So they, my job was to cold call, mostly uh, old ladies, old, old, those in the second half of life, uh, and, and tell them that if, if they didn't pay their debts, uh, I was, something bad was going to happen. Uh, it was the first time I experienced a panic attack uh, trying to do that. So I decided criminal justice was not for me. A lot of other things went into that decision making. So I decided to go in the opposite direction, which was um, uh, Pima Community College was offering a two-year cabinet making program uh, where you would go and learn how to make uh, cabinets. And it wasn't part of the actual cabinet making career. It was like a, like a, you had to do two years and then you started your apprenticeship. And I quickly found out that I didn't want to do that because it's not as lucrative as it sounds. So uh, the third option was to, 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 do the Lord's work and uh, apply to seminary, and uh, and that's that's why I'm here. So uh, I'm not making cabinets. I'm not in criminal justice. I serve as a pastor at a church in Queen Creek, and it's been good for the most part. It's been really great. Uh, when I was at the postal inspector, I had a conversation with my supervisor. Uh, he and I were um, there was this thing where we had to like bag evidence uh, in like the evidence evidence. It was mail. We were bagging like people's letters and things like that. And he found out I was a Christian. He was a Christian. And he's, he taught and, and served at his church and uh, was really active and involved. And so we started talking about faith. And I was talking about how I wanted three things. I wanted a stable income. I wanted a family. And I wanted to do what I felt God was calling me to do. Uh, so those, that, when I was, I, did, I didn't know anything else. I knew I wanted something in the realms of like stable income, family, do what God was leading me to do. Um, and in my mind, those things were so separate. I'm doing th- two of those three things, by the way. And I'll let you guess which two of those three. In my mind, those things were distinct. And I'll never forget the way he looked at me like I was an idiot because I was going back and forth between, do I do seminary? Do I do police work? Uh, mail work? Whatever. Uh, this was before cabinet making, so that wasn't a thing. And, uh, and he kind of looked at me like I was an idiot. And he said, you know, you can do both. Like, you can do everything. You can, you can do this job if you want, and go and serve in your church. And those three things don't have to be separate. And I had no category for what that meant. I had no category for how it, what it, I mean, what does it mean to like follow Jesus, do what I feel like God is calling me to do, but also like make a little bit of money and have a family and build a life for myself and make sure my kids are taken care of and all of that. I had, I was really good at compartmentalizing. I had distinct categories for my life. There's my, my work life, my social life, my personal life my future, my spiritual life, that was all distinct. And outside of Sundays, and maybe if I came to a group, I don't know what we were doing at the time, groups on Wednesdays or something like that, Thursdays, uh, then that was it. And I think a lot of us, there's a tendency for us to view our, our discipleship to Jesus that way, where we have different compartments in our lives that we put Jesus in. And as much as we say we don't do that, I think a lot of us do that. Uh, The way that we think about our spirituality, the way that we think about following Jesus, there's little overlap in terms of career choices or even benign choices, choices that don't seem to make a difference, like where we go to eat uh, or what we do in the morning, what our morning routines look like, who we interact with, how we talk to people. The radical claim of Christianity, and the more I've given my life to following Jesus, the more convinced that I've become that the invitation of Jesus is, is to reorient 
your entire life, everything about who you are around Jesus and his kingdom. And the question is, how do we do that? And that's a lot of what 1 Corinthians is about. Um, there's a small community. It's a growing community, but there are new believers uh, coming from all sorts of different uh, walks of life. Corinth was like a, a hub, a pantheon of gods and goddesses were worshipped in a lot of different ways. And Paul is writing to a new church community that's trying to figure out what does it mean to actually follow Jesus? How do we not compartmentalize? Do we just add him on to our worship of these other Greek gods and goddesses? Is he, does he, is he above those other Greek gods and goddesses? Do we, uh, does this affect how I go to this other temple and worship? Does this affect um, how I treat my spouse to, or people in my community? What, is, what does it mean to actually follow Jesus? And Paul's main idea is just that, that following Jesus should affect every part of your life. That's really what Corinth is about. It's a really practical letter. Uh, and he covers things like uh, rivalry and division. What do you do when there's conflict in a community? So you, you join a community like this. Let's say you just, you, you've decided to give up whatever God you were worshiping in, in favor of this, this risen rabbi, this resurrected Jewish rabbi, and, and you center your life around him. So you join a community of like-minded people that want to learn more about doing that uh, as well. And all of a sudden there's conflict. How do you sort through that? Um, what does maturity look like? How do you, how do you uh, grow? What does it mean to actually get in, you know, good standing with this God and with each other. He's covered what it looks like uh, to live out the wisdom of Jesus and how living, if you're going to commit yourself to this life, and these people knew what that was like, maybe persecution hadn't happened yet, but they were definitely at odds with the world around them. Early Christians were, were weird. They were described as being weird. Uh, people didn't like them because they didn't fit in with society. So when you come into a community like this, you know that uh, the way that you live your life is not going to look like the way of the world. It's actually going to look really dumb compared to what the world is, how the world is telling you to live. And Paul calls that wisdom. But now in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, there's a problem in Corinth. And um, uh, it's kind of a doozy. So I'm going to read it, and then we're going to talk about it. So this is 1 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 1. This is Paul writing. It says, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you something that even pagans don't do. I'm told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. And you are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame. And you should remove this man from your fellowship. Even though I'm not with you in person, I'm with you in spirit. As though I were there, I've already passed judgment on this man in the name of the Lord Jesus. You must call a meeting of the church. I will be present with you in spirit, and so will the power of our Lord Jesus then you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. Uh, so uh, uh, a man is sleeping with a stepmom, which is pretty bad. Can we all, that's not good, right? Are we all in agreement? Can I start there? Okay. I don't know. I haven't been here in a while. I don't know you guys. I don't know. Uh, Paul points this out too. Even the Gentiles, even the pagans is what he says. Even the pagans think this is not a good idea. And the pagans, uh, just so you know, Corinth was a very like sexually liberous city. Uh, they, they, I mean, you take, talk about the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s. They kind of took that off. Our culture is, is very um, close to, to the culture in Corinth. Uh, the culture in Corinth was maybe even more, you know, free when it comes to that sort of stuff. I'm choosing my language very carefully. There are kids here. Uh, that being said, even they had laws. Actually, to be called a Corinthian was like a slang term. Uh, it, it meant that you were a, uh, you were promiscuous. It was a very kind way of saying you were someone who's promiscuous. You were like a sex worker, to put it kindly, to call someone a Corinthian. So this is a culture that is known for its uh, liberation, for its uh, hedonism, and everything of those sorts. But in Roman law, this type of relationship was still uh, actually illegal. So Paul's saying there, you're doing something that not even the pagan, not even the world around you, uh, would approve of. And worse, it's not just you're doing it, but you're actually boasting about it. There's something happening. There's something, you, something's wrong in this community. Not only that this is happening, but that you guys seem to be so proud of it. And we don't know how this relationship came about. I mean, we don't know who this man was. Paul clearly knows who it was specifically, and he knows that the church knows who it is. So it's not like people are reading this and they're like, oh my gosh, who who could be doing that? It's like, no, we know. It's like Joe or whoever. I didn't mean to pick Joe. I'm sorry. I just realized it was Joe. It's just a guy. It's just a guy in our community. We know who this is, and we're proud of it. We don't know why they were boasting. It was likely some combination of like them bringing their worldview into it. So it was like this weird thought where, you know, maybe we're we're showing the world how forgiving we are. 
we don't care. We've evolved. We've matured past sin. We've matured past judgment. We don't, we don't want to cast judgment on anybody. This is an open community. Everybody's welcome here. And Paul says that's not right. Something, something has gone wrong. At the same time, um, Paul seems a little harsh here. I think so. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you're like, yeah, send the guy to hell. Like that's essentially what Paul's saying. Gives his man over to Satan, destroy his sin nature, all that stuff. So I think that there's actually something really profound uh, that this passage says about uh, sin, about community, and about sexuality. Uh, and so for the rest of our time, uh, I just want to answer those three questions. What does sin do to a person? What does sin actually do to us? What does sin do to a community? And why does God care about our sexuality? Does that sound good? Can we... All right. So first, what does sin do to a person? Uh, notice Paul's line in verse 5. What's Paul's solution? How do you deal with this? Paul says, throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed. Uh, I'll explain the Satan part in a minute. Uh, but again, it seems a little harsh, a little overreactive. It's, the church is meant to be this open community where everybody's welcome to come and experience the love and grace of Jesus. Why are we saying that this man who did one wrong thing, really bad thing, but one wrong thing, uh, basically be cast out to Satan? I would argue it's because few of us have a full awareness of what sin actually is. Uh, so if you're like me, um, and maybe you're not, and, and I don't know, like I said, I haven't been here in a while, so I don't know if you guys know about sin or don't know about sin, but I grew up. Uh, where sin was just a catch-all phrase uh, to mean everything uh, that you do that's wrong. And so we, the argument went like this. We do bad things in life. The gospel was explained to me this way. This is how I've explained the gospel to people is you do bad things. Even if you don't think you do bad things, you've told a lie in your life. You've done something wrong. You, with your, with your actions, with your body, with your words, have hurt other people. And worst of all, you've hurt God. And because you've done those wrong things, you are at odds with God. There's punishment that you deserve, but God loves you. And so instead of punishing you, he's going to send Jesus, who's going to take your place on the cross. Jesus is going to accept your punishment. And from now until heaven, you just do your best not to sin. But if you do, it's okay, because Jesus died for it. But, but don't try not to do it, because it's, sin's not good, and, and it makes God angry with you. Uh, now, I, most, I believe that's true. I believe sin is defined that way, and I believe that sin does put us at odds with God. And I believe that, that it does, we deserve something, that God clearly does not like sin and he's built within his character justice. So uh, we deserve a consequence of sin and Jesus pays that consequence for us. But if that's all that sin is, then this passage doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't the solution that just be like, tell this guy not to sin anymore or something? I mean, there's, there has to be something more going on here. Uh, sin nature, I love how the NLT describes it. That's actually an added word, sin nature. Uh, in the Greek, uh, I took one semester of Greek, so I talk a lot about Greek now. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Greek word is, anybody know? I'm, Greek word for sin nature, flesh. Sarks. Did you just graduate? That's all right. The Greek word uh, for what's uh, translated here as sin nature is the word flesh or the word sarks. And a lot of times it means your body. Flesh, sarks means just what you do with your body, your phys physicality. It can mean your ethnicity. Uh, but it's also one of the New Testament author's favorite word to describe uh, what Paul is describing here, which is a sin nature. It's a part of us. There's something in us, a nature within us that is at odds with those around us and with the way of Jesus. And it affects those around us. Every, it affects what we do. Paul defines it this way in Romans 7. Uh, this is a famous, you know, struggle passage. Paul says, I don't really understand myself. For I do what I do, what I, I, it's so confusing to say. I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. In other words, I know that the way of Jesus is the right way to live. I know that intellectually, but there's a disconnect. There's dissonance between how I'm living and what I know to be true. Paul says this, so I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And there's a lot of weird things that you could do with that passage, unbiblical things. Uh, but for our purposes this morning, uh, notice the distinction here. Sin is not described as an action. It causes action. It's a driving force. It's a nature. It's something inside Paul. Paul, this is, 
most scholars agree, this is Paul after he's been converted. This is Paul describing what it's like to struggle and live as a Christian. There's still something in you that is putting you at odds with God, with the way of Jesus, that you know to be true. And all of us know what this is like. The, the things that we know that we should be doing. To follow Jesus, to submit our lives to him, and to love others well. Something gets in the way of that. For a lot of us, it's pride. For some of us, it's fear. Fear. Um, uh, St. Augustine, in the famous his, you know, seminal work, City of God, describes it as disordered desires. There's something in you. that You have, you have conflate, conflicting desires in your Part of you wants to follow Jesus. The other part of you wants to do something really bad with your stepmother, uh, which is not true, I hope, of anybody here. But we can relate to that. Maybe, well, not in that sense. But we can relate to this, right? Paul uses more language in Romans and Galatians. He calls sin a power. In other words, sin is not just the bad things that we do. It's a power within us. It's that deep inner tension we feel when we know the right thing. We know how to follow Jesus, and yet we still can't do it. All this to say, following Jesus is not just about right and wrong. I think that's what Paul wants to make abundantly clear in this passage. It's not just about doing the wrong things. It's more about being free versus being enslaved. And Scripture tells us time and time again, and experience tells us, the more that you engage with sin, the more that you become enslaved to it. It promises something. It allures you. It entices you. It promises a deep satisfaction that only God can fill. And when you do it and you don't get it, it keeps you in that cycle of sin, shame, guilt, running and hiding. It's the garden narrative told all over again. Adam and Eve sin against God. They get what they want. And what do they do? They run and they hide. We relive that every single day when we give in to sin. All this to say, the things that we do do something to us. Uh, Ken Shigematsu, who's an author, a pastor, um, has a book that I was reading this week, and he, he puts it this way. As we turn away from our creator, so that's sin. As we turn away from our creator, our hearts experience distorted desires for pleasure, for power, and privilege, which in turn breed shame, fear, and alienation from God, our true selves, and one another. So the danger of sin isn't just that it puts us at odds with God, though it certainly does that. The real danger of sin is that it also puts us in danger of ourselves. Something is happening at a soul level when we give in to sin like this, when we start tolerating things like this. Uh, That's what Paul's saying. Paul's, I think, coming in pretty hot here. Imagine this community that's celebrating how gracious and loving and merciful they are towards this sinful person. And Paul comes in and says, no, you got to cast this guy out. Give him over to Satan. Something's happening to this community because something's happening in this man's soul. When you give in to sin, something happens in your soul. And here's why this is important. If you only have a moral category for sin, meaning if if sin is only about doing right things or, or not doing wrong things, then you completely miss out on how dangerous it is. We focus on behavior. We focus on action. We end up stuck. There's something we just can't break free from these cycles. If we focus more on modifying our behavior, on just trying really hard to not do the wrong thing and to try doing the right thing instead, uh, that sin, it doesn't work that way. And sin just gets a deeper and deeper hold in our hearts and it becomes more and more enticing. But more importantly, If we only have a moral category for sin, then we completely miss out on what Jesus actually came to do. Pay a penalty, yes. Forgive, yes. Redeem and restore, also yes. Deal with those parts of us, those parts of us that we hide, those parts of us that are at odds with the way of Jesus that we are aware of, the things that we don't want to submit or confess to one another in our communities. That's the part of you that Jesus wants to heal. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus can heal it. No amount of sin, no no action or deep-rooted feeling, desire is beyond Jesus redeeming. And that is especially true when it comes to our sexuality. So what does sin do to a community? Let's keep reading. Verse 6. You're boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize that this is sin is like a little yeast that spreads throughout the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So let us celebrate the festival, not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth. 
When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin, but I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin, or is greedy, or worships idols, or is abusive, or is a drunkard, or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside who are, who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but as the scripture says, you must remove the evil person from among you. So Paul uh, starts talking about yeast, and he talks about bread and Passover and all that stuff. Uh, here's the context. Passover was an annual night where the Jewish people uh, would remember God saving them from Egypt. Most of us probably know that story. Uh, that night that they would escape, part of God's instruction was for them to bake their dinner bread without yeast because it wouldn't have time uh, to rise before they left. And so to remember this, when the, when the Jewish people would celebrate Passover every year, uh, they would clear their house of all yeast. They wouldn't just not bake bread with yeast. They would eliminate all the yeast from their house. Because if the yeast stayed in the house, symbolically, it would, it would scar, it would taint, infect the celebration of the Passover. So Paul's main point is this. Your sin never really stops with you. Just like a little bit of yeast uh, corrupts, I don't know how baking works. My understanding, I didn't do any research. Bake, I don't know. Yeast does something to bread, right? It makes it rise. <laughs> you guys bake bread, right? Uh, yeast does something to bread. It affects all of the bread. Paul's saying the, the, one of the biggest dangers you can believe, one of the biggest lies that you can believe about your sin is that it stops with you. And the truth is it just doesn't work that way, especially for a community designed uh, like uh, this community, like the community of uh, what call, Paul calls the body, the church, um, the gathering of believers who have given their lives to Jesus. Something happens when you commit to doing this on a Sunday morning, uh, something really deep and, and really spiritual that is deeply impacted by sin. And we're not talking about like daily struggle sin. So Paul, notice he says those who indulge in sexual sin. So all of us are going to keep sinning, right? We're going to keep coming to church and everything's going to be fine. No one's getting excommunicated. Um, what Paul is talking about is the type of subtle sin uh, that's first just acknowledged. And then eventually it's tolerated and then soon it's fully accepted. And then eventually it becomes celebrated. And all of a sudden you turn into a community that either gets hurt by sin Someone in a community, when you, when you are in tight relationship with people that, that you love and, and who have given their lives to something that you've also given your life towards, and all of a sudden you introduce something that, that does not belong into that community, that hurts the people around you. Or you become a community like this one where you're defined by that sin, you end up celebrating it and you start boasting about it, or communities hide it. And this is why we see a lot, you know, the churches that, uh, justify power. Is that my kid? That is my kid. Churches that justify using their power to hide sin cause so much damage because of this exact reason. If sin was just individual, there would be no repercussions throughout a community. But churches rise and fall based on the, the, the holiness, the sanctification of their leaders. If somebody in power starts believing this lie that their sin is not going to infect or affect the people that they lead, that's when churches crumble. But don't miss this. Notice who Paul is calling out here. He's not calling out uh, the port sailors. Corinth was a port city, so you had all these sailors coming in and out, uh, believing in different gods, worshiping at the temples with thousands of temple prostitutes uh, who are getting them to worship in that way. Paul's saying, don't worry about them. They're greedy. They're swindlers. If I, if I was telling you not to associate with them, you'd have to leave the world. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there is a high degree of accountability. When you enter into what the Bible calls a covenant relationship with people in this community, you are joining a global body that is marked by holiness, by its devotion to Jesus and the way that Jesus says is the way to live. And so the problem in Corinth isn't really just this man's sin, though it is a problem. To Paul, the bigger problem is that this church is tolerating, accepting, and celebrating this man's sin. And so what's the solution? Send that guy to hell. Cast him off to Satan. That's essentially what he's saying. There's a protective, something happens when you gather in this community here, God is present. There's some kind of protection, some, something that happens when people commit themselves to following the way of Jesus together, that when you leave it, 
you are in, according to the New Testament authors, the, the world, the domain of, of Satan himself, where Satan rules and, and influences. When you come here, this is for strengthening. That's what the body helps. I mean, it's what we do every Sunday when we gather. To expel this wicked person from among you uh, is for the destruction of his flesh, for his sin nature, uh, and for the restoration of his soul. So excommunication get, kind of gets a bad rap, I think. I don't know. Maybe not. Paul's actually quoting from a few passages in Deuteronomy. This would have been really common uh, for God's people, for the Jewish people. Uh, as they're looking in the Old Testament about how to follow Jesus after they've been saved from the Egyptians, they want to know what does it look like to live in a community. And time and time again, in Leviticus 18, Deuteronomy 22, there are specific rules about what to do when somebody uh, intentionally disobeys the will of God. What do you do when someone threatens the community? You get that person out of the community. But notice Paul's reasoning. It's for the restoration of his soul, the destruction of his flesh. So Paul's desire isn't that this man is going to experience this sort of hell on earth, this weird punishment, and be tormented by Satan. Paul's desire is for this man to be left on his own, for him to get what he wants, for him to, to continue indulging in this sin, for that part, of, for him to realize that that's not actually leading to the satisfaction in the life that, that he's after. It actually causes more problems than uh, he anticipates. And for him to come back either into the community or what Paul calls on the day of the Lord, when Jesus comes back and makes all things new and all of that. In other words, the goal is purging. It's not punishment. It's kind of like the parable of the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son, what does he do? He wants, he wants his father dead, essentially. He wants his inheritance. He wants to go live life and do uh, everything that he is not supposed to do, indulge in all of his fantasies and things like that. What brings the prodigal son back to the house? It's not the condemnation of the older brother. It's not the condemnation of the household. It's the end result of his sin and the everlasting love and grace of his father. The prodigal son gets what he sees that he deserves. He gets the end result. Where, where sin leads is not a good place. And the best case scenario, if you're going to go down that route, is that you, you experience the consequences of sin outside the community in this life so that you can come back inside the community. That's what Paul's saying. When you leave the community, and your sin nature is exposed. Something happens. In a perfect world, it's purged out of you. So lastly, why does God care so much about sexuality? Uh, it's a fair question, I think. I think one of us, uh, one that many of us are going to have to ask at some point. Uh, as, again, I don't know. It's hard. It's getting difficult to figure out what it means to graciously love people uh, or to sort through things ourselves when it comes to our sexuality. How do we experience and express our sexuality in a world that is remarkably similar to uh, first century Corinth, first century Rome, uh, where sex sexual liberation is defined as freedom, where removing any protocol or inhibitions within reason, I mean, even the Romans had laws, but for the most part, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Why does God care so much about sexuality? We're going to read this last chunk and then we'll be done. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, Paul says, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, again, we're not talking about people who are in the community who struggle with these things. Paul's talking about people who are committed to this way of life over the way of Jesus. If you have any questions about that, ask Ryan and Megan. Uh, some of you were once like that. But you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. This is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Run from sexual sin. No other sin 
so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God brought you, bought you with a high price. So you must honor your God, honor God with your body. So a few thoughts on this, and then we'll close. Paul, again, is addressing a worldview very similar to ours. Uh, heavily influenced by uh, Greek philosophers that argue there's a difference between the spiritual world and the physical world. So, spiritual world, good. Physical world, bad. Everything spiritual is good. Everything physical is bad. Everything physical doesn't really matter. Spiritual is what matters. If you worship God, you have good feelings, good devotions, you sing songs, that's good. It doesn't matter what you do the rest of the week because it's just physical. Food is made for the body and body for food. Nothing more, nothing less. You're just a meat pocket. I don't know. It's just your flesh and bones that house the real you that's on the inside. And we see this in our time today. The real you, that authentic you, is, is something that's found on the inside. Um, when people imagine heaven, for example, a lot of us imagine these sort of disembodied spirits. And scripture is pretty clear that there's going to be a resurrection, a physical restoration of a created world. We are going to have restored and resurrected bodies. Again, questions, don't ask me. Um, spiritual life is separate from your everyday life. This is, what I, this is what I think a lot of us do. This is what I was doing right after college. My spiritual life, I'll figure that out later. I'll serve on church five times, but I want to I make money and have a family. That's thinking this way. There's a difference between the spiritual and the physical. In verse 13, Paul uh, quotes a phrase that was really popular in Corinth. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. God's going to destroy them both. It doesn't matter. In other words, food is for the body and the body's for food. Everything physical is just physical. When you're hungry, you're eat, you eat. But when you want sex, you have sex. There is no deeper meaning or impact than that. It's not really a big deal. Paul corrects this in verse 13. The body is not meant for just physical sustenance and pleasure. You do not have a body. You are a body. Throughout the scriptures, your flesh, your entire being is defined as your whole person. This goes back to Hebrew understanding of what a person is. You follow Jesus with your body, not just your mind, not just your heart, not just your devotion with your actions, with your habits, with your body, with what you eat, with what you do. When you, when you engage in intimacy, physical intimacy with someone, it impacts the deepest parts of you. We know this to be true. Paul is reminding the Jewish readers that they've also known this. Since the beginning of time, he quotes Genesis. They will become one flesh. Something happens. If sin, if sin distorts every part of you, then sin, sexual sin destroys, distorts every part of you. And the other person that you engage with. So God cares about sex, not because he's a stickler or anything like that. It's because it's, it's, it's we have this phrase saying, someone said to me once that I can't stop thinking about, um, sin isn't bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. There's something about following those impulses and those desires that harms us and harms those around us. And it harms us even though it might seem like just a physical act with our bodies. So tying this all together, here's what we get in 1 Corinthians 5. This wonderful passage. It's great. Uh, sin is a cancerous infection. It's a part of you. It's a nature. It's something inside of you that puts you at, puts you at odds with God. And the more that you satisfy those inclinations, as small as they might seem, the harder it is to say no to them. And the more, the more it feeds, the more it grows. And festers, and soon it, it expands and it, it impacts every part of the community that you're in. So it impacts not only you, but also the people that you're closest to. And in a community of, of, of like this one, a community of people who are gathered, committed to coming on a Sunday uh, to this campus and worship Jesus together, uh, the sin that you struggle with, that you're denying, will have an impact on those around you. I'm not saying it's, you're going to find out and everyone's going to broadcast it or whatever, but I'm, no one's writing a letter to you, like specifying your sin. But I am saying this, that when you give in to sin and you start satisfying that parts of you that wants to be satisfied, it gets harder to actually love and serve others. And this is especially true when it comes to sexual sin. Sexual sin isn't just a physical act. It's something that happens in your bodies that affects those around you and can infiltrate a community like this one. But here's where the gospel comes in. So Jesus comes to earth. And again, the gospel that I was sold said something like, he came to die. Uh, and that was his primary reason for coming. And we just kind of skip over everything else. 
The gospel starts really in the first pages of scripture, but it also includes the life of Jesus. Jesus shows us what it looks like to live without giving into this power, without giving into the sin nature, to live life for the sake of others, to not give into temptation, to, to live a life of holiness. What is it? What is it? What's possible? What does it look like when we say no and we deny this? And we're all we're not going to be like Jesus, obviously. But Paul says in Galatians that there is something, we have a new power in us. Sin is a power, yes. When we follow Jesus, we have the spirit within us that helps the power within us overcome the power of the flesh. That walking in step with the spirit, doing what we're doing, routine things that don't seem to do anything, like show up on Sundays or serve or pray when we don't feel like it, worship, fast, do all the practices that you guys are engaging in. Even when those don't do anything, they're doing something to you. That's what Paul says is walking in the spirit. The more that you do that, the more you learn how to deny the flesh. First Peter 2, Peter says Jesus commits no sin, but he carried our sin in his body on the cross. So the invitation of Jesus isn't just to be saved from hell and condemnation and punishment, though it is that. It's so much more than that. It's to be restored from sin, to actually yield the parts of us that we are the most ashamed of, in community like this one, to yield and be open with those around us about the struggles that we have, to submit that part of our lives, those parts of who we are to Jesus in community, that's where we find healing. And that's the invitation of the gospel, to reorient your life around Jesus, what he's come to do, what he can do in you, not free you from all sin, but make it a little easier to fight, to grow, to become a person who looks more and more like Jesus. This is what Jesus calls life and life in abundance. And the more that we submit our lives to him, more than just our minds and our devotions, but also our bodies, the deepest parts of who we are, the more that he's able to transform, to restore, and to heal. That's the invitation of the gospel. So why don't I pray, and then we'll move on. So Father, we, we love you. God, and we thank you for um, the invitation that you give all of us uh, to follow you and to, to give up more and more of our lives to you and, and not to find shame and condemnation, though that's what we're afraid of, but to find um, love and acceptance and joy, uh, freedom that's found in, in, in your forgiveness. So God, I pray that as we um, reflect on this text, as we reflect on our own sin and our own lives, that um, you would allow us to honestly recognize sin that we're hiding. Sin that is rebellion against you, but also sin that's uh, damaging ourselves. And that as we bring those things to you, that we would find healing, that we'd find hope, that this community, as a result of its um, commitment to following you and to practicing this community together, would, would be marked by, by that, by, by loving acceptance of those who are also willing to yield their sin to you. So we thank you for the, for the good news of the gospel, that, that you've come to save us, to heal us, to restore us, and to offer us life that we can't find on our own. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. Thank you for joining the Damascus Road podcast. Our mission is to follow Jesus together by being with God, loving everyone, transforming people, developing leaders, growing new ministries, and changing the world. You can find out more about us online at damascusroadtucson.com.